And we're back. Uh, welcome to another Red Monk uh, What Is How To video. Uh, today I am joined by Kent from Bonsai. Uh, Kent, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thanks Steve. I'm a sales engineer here at Bonsai and my role is mapping industrial uh, control problems to uh, re deep reinforcement learning. And that is actually the purpose of our conversation here today. We want to discuss uh, precisely what is uh, deep reinforcement learning. And, um, you know, as part of that, you know, sort of what is a simulator? So we want to dig into those two concepts. So, uh, Ken, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, sounds great. So, first let's start with the use case spectrum. There's a lot of things that people are calling AI, and I just want to be clear about what we consider and call industrial AI. So. Um, on the right hand side are things more like data mining, data analysis, uh, predicting events, but on the left hand side are what we call industrial AI and it's really automating or optimizing systems. So making industrial systems more intelligent. Right. Those uh, use cases tend to uh, yield, uh, lean towards or uh, deep reinforcement learning works really, really well in these kinds of use cases. They're things like robotics, things like um, uh, plan maintenance, uh, automatically calibrating a machine, or it could be a virtual system, like optimizing a supply chain or a network. Right. So in other words, we're not here to talk about HAL 9000 or you know any of that other stuff that uh, people tend to tend to try to loop in when they're talking um, exactly. AI. No, no chatbots today. Yeah. Um, no, Perfect. <laughs> no, no vision and perception systems. All right, I'll take it. All right, so what is deep reinforcement learning? So it's essentially letting an AI uh, we call them brains, uh, learn by practicing. Mm -hmm. um, it uh, gets to try out an action and then um, you give it a reward um, or uh, a penalty based on how it does. So it's just like when, you know, I practice the saxophone or my uh, four-year-old uh, kid practices writing and you um, you give him a cookie when he does it, does it well. <laughs> um, what kind of cookies are we giving the machines here? <laughs> so they're uh, they're just points on a <laughs> zeros and ones, yeah, yeah, um, um, but it's actually why a simulator is so important um, because the AI needs a place to practice, mm -hmm. and so uh, simulators have been around for a really really long time, uh, way before AI was um, you know a thing or, or we thought about using uh, a simulator to train AI. Mm -hmm. It's just an imitation of uh, a real world process or system. Yep. Uh, some people now are calling them uh, digital twins. Um, there's uh, simulators in uh, robotics like gazebo, supply chain like AnyLogic, manufacturing, um, and a bunch of other things. MATLAB Simulink is a really big one. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a bunch of energy ones. In fact, uh, they're all over the enterprise. And uh, you know, in all these areas of optimizing, controlling, monitoring, and, and maintaining sy systems, there's simulators in specific ind industries for those specific um, topics. Um, now, what makes that really convenient for us is that our platform is designed to train brains um, in simulation. So it gives the AIs a great place to practice and a great place to learn. And so I'd love to walk through a use case of a uh, an industrial control system that we've come across and that, that we work on uh, optimizing a wind farm, the energy optimization of a wind farm. Perfect, let's hear about it. Excellent, so the first thing that you wanna do when optimizing or controlling these industrial systems is you wanna define the goal and then simulate the process. So in this case, you've got 52, 100 wind turbines and they're modeled out in MATLAB and Simulink. And so what you see on the right-hand side is um, that model of the things you can control in a wind turbine, the yaw command, the yaw torque command, et cetera, et cetera. And that bonsai block in the middle is what communicates with our AI engine so it can control the training process. Okay. What you're trying to optimize is you're trying to maximize the power output of the wind farm. And so if there's six things that you can, six knobs you can turn on each wind turbine and there's a hundred wind turbines, that's 600 knobs to turn. And for even an expert operator, 
um, that's very, very, very difficult to do right. is turn 600 knobs optimally to get um, the right um, to get the right mixture. And then when you add in the external conditions that change constantly, like wind patterns, weather patterns, um, and the wake that they create on each other, it's like the wake on a boat, the wind they right. blow on each other, yep. then it's actually impossible yep. for a, a human to optimize on their own. And so the second step is to decompose the problem and define machine teaching. So um, at Bonsai, we created this language called Inkling. You can see an example of it on the right. It's the only language out there to define how you teach a machine something. Mm -hmm. uh, Python and a lot of other languages um, are great at determining how a machine learns something, machine learning, but Inkling is about how you teach a machine something. Um, and it defines the concepts to teach. So in this case, it defines the state um, it defines the the command that you're giving uh, to the wind turbine. Um, it defines the fact that it's an estimator versus a classifier. A classifier is if there were notches on the knobs, you know, zero, one, two, three kind of thing. Yep. An estimator is where it's a range, any range of, uh, of commands that you can give. It defines the simulator. Um, it defines a curriculum um, with lessons, all the things you'd think about teaching, and it defines the um, reward function that assessment, the cookie, um, the cookie reward and system. Before we go on, how, how long does it typically take people to pick up Inkling? Um, it's about the same complexity as SQL. Okay. So um, if you know SQL, um, it's going to be really, I mean, it's going to be hours or days. If okay. you're a developer, it's going to be hours for sure. Got it. Or even minutes. Um, and this is where the magic happens, where we teach the AI. It's where our AI engine connects to the simulation and orchestrates the training. So we just have a, a video running while we're talking here of um, the MATLAB Simulink simulator running. And you can see the wind turbine uh, spinning and you can see the different um, parts of the model there. And what's happening is uh, in the bottom right, there's a little log file going. Each of those is an iteration where the AI is, the brain is um, saying, this is what I wanna try. The AI engine says, uh, okay, that's interesting. The simulator says this is the state or what will happen to the power output if you do that. Right. And then it gives it the reward or the penalty. Yep. And that graph on the left-hand side is showing us how well it's doing. So over time, that training graph increases and plateaus. That means it's getting competent at uh, at the task, at optimizing the task. Yeah. Yeah, so essentially you're, you're juggling hundreds, if not thousands of variables, you know, sort of repeatedly over and over and over, essentially to try to optimize a process. Um, in this case, you know, certainly for a wind farm, but for really any industrial task then. Um, is that about the size of it? That's that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So if you can simulate it and model it, then you can train a brain to optimize it or control it. Yeah. And how long uh, did it take to set this up, um, you know, for the wind farm? So this, it, the process of training is iterative. Um, training a complex model um, would take about eight hours. Okay. Um, training a simpler model, which this uh, demo that you're seeing is just optimizing one wind turbine. That's just a couple of hours. But um, beyond the training time of uh, the one model, there's iterating. And really the hardest thing is getting that reward function, that cookie um, uh, doling out system correct. Right. Um, and we've seen, especially in complex robotics tasks, where there's a lot of bloopers where you um, you gave it a reward and it it did what you told it to. <laughs> um, you had to tweak that reward to get it right. Um, we do have some tools that allow us to um, make the training go quicker, uh, which is, uh, they're called concepts. You split the problem up into different tasks. And uh, we can also run multiple simulators, uh, even dozens of simulators in parallel to rapidly accelerate the training. Nice. And so what is this typically used instead of? In other words, when you walk into a customer, how are they typically trying to solve this problem already? Uh, I assume it's not manually, but I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. So how, how are they, what are you competing with here? Right, so we're competing with a couple things. One is operators. Mm -hmm. And so um, in the case of uh, wind farms, there's actually an operator, they're tweaking the controls. And what we hear is that usually there's about not just in wind farms, but across the, the board in manufacturing and other verticals, um, there's about 10% of the operators that are experts and really, really good at it. Mm -hmm. um, our, machine, our machines can beat those operators, but even so, a lot of the folks are coming to us because they want 
to standardize their training. Right. So they don't know how to get the rest of their operators up to the level of their experts and they want a decision support. They want a laptop sure. of streaming decisions saying, this is actually what you should be trying, right. uh, Mr. Operator. Yeah. The other thing that we're competing against is um, traditional control systems. We've got people using PID controllers, mm -hmm. um, model predictive yeah, control. Explain that with the PID. Um, that's proportional integrate integral derivative controls. Uh, it's kind of the, the basic um, off-the-shelf uh, controller um, that a lot of us have still in our thermostats. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a spectrum that goes all the way to model predictive control, which is about um, 20, 20 or so years old, which uses much more um, advanced techniques um, to predict, but it's quite rigid. And so deep reinforcement learning can um, definitely outperform it when the conditions change a lot, which in a complex system like this, where you have wind patterns, and weather patterns, model predictor control will fail if your weather um, predictions are not very, very accurate. So there's different reasons why deep reinforcement learning kind of acts as kind of an extension of um, some of those uh, traditional um, control systems. And in fact, people are coming to us and saying, we have a bunch of PID controllers or we have MPC controllers and we want you to train RL to, you know, learn them and supersede them. Right. Yeah, no, which makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, so it, it's, you know, basically when we when we think about this, um, you know, I think a couple things to me jump out, you know, first of all, which is the, the essentially focus here, uh, right? You know, as we talked about from the top, you know, we have a, a, you know, sort of laser focus, if you will, sort of on the industrial, on specific use cases, as opposed to, hey, we're gonna solve every AI problem known to mankind. Um, but then exactly. also trying to marry, you know, essentially a set of processes, uh, you know, to you know, try to try to um, make make more efficient, uh, if you will, you know, a, a variety of different training exercises in an industrial setting. Um, yeah, so that's really cool. Exactly right. Thanks a lot, Steve. Not at all. Not at all. Thanks so much for being with me and explaining to us what deep reinforcement learning is. I appreciate it.